Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you so much for being here for this uh, screening of Ted K. What a phenomenal movie. I would love to introduce uh, uh, director Tony Stone. We have a uh, producer, Matt Flanders. And please welcome Charlotte Copley. <laughs> Well, I, you know, when I saw that this was a movie about Ted Kaczynski, I was expecting something conventional, and conventional is absolutely not what this movie is, and that is absolutely to its credit. It is a riveting, gripping, powerful film, and I, I just would love to, uh, right? I mean, it's amazing, really amazing, and Charlto, your performance is, is absolutely phenomenal. So my first question is, of course, it's the obvious one. How did this come about? And I want to start with you, Tony. Um, how did it come about? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> loaded question. Yeah, loaded work. Um, uh, yeah, it was an idea I had for a while, uh, you know, about 10 years ago. And then, uh, you know, the story kind of got more and more interesting the further we got from his arrest. And the more, you know, his ideas actually had, uh, you know, you know, there was sort of a, you know, um, you know, the prophetic part of his ideas uh, that, you know, I think 20 years ago people thought were kind of absurd and would never come true, you know, as we're dealing with environmental degradation and, you know, technological addiction and all these sorts of things, the themes became stronger. Um, but it was a story I wanted to tell because, uh, you know, it was, um, you know, it was something that happened, you know, in 1996 and, you know, it was a very simplistic you know, how it was reported was very straightforward and simplistic. And like any of these stories, the more you dig, the more interesting it gets. Um, so, you know, wanted to, t wanted to, you know, also look at it from the, from the aspect of alternative history and look at other sort of American terrorists, you know, from people like John Brown to, you know, even how the, you know, Black Panthers and Fred Hampton. So it was kind of in the context of looking at domestic terrorism um, that I, 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 you know, thought the story would be interesting to tell. Um, and then just really wanted to tell, you know, an immersive, subjective version of Kaczynski, you know, and kind of get away from the cliche narratives of, you know, law enforcement tropes and all this stuff and see what it was like to really be with a villain and see if you could identify and, you know, find the humanity in with somebody that was technically evil. You know, good and evil is something that I don't really, you know, think is actually exists, you know, it's far more complicated than that. Um, so anyway, that's sort of where the story or the, you know, my interest began, and then from there we kind of just managed to make a movie out of it. So, so Matt, wait, how, tell me about the first conversations that you had with Tony, not just about <laughs> the subject matter of the film, but about the way the movie was going to be made, the style, the impressionistic, avant-garde version that we saw. So I just looked back on my emails to see when the first email I got from um, Tony's <laughs> and his um, and another executive producer named uh, Melissa Oftemar, who happens to also be Tony's wife. And they sent me an email uh, when I was working at Plan B, um, Brad Pitt's company, um, in 2013. So that's the first, I, it was August of 2013, and I am originally from Montana, so reading that, uh, script, I was really fascinated about the Montana aspect of it, of course, because all the other stories I'd seen about him had to do with the manhunt and the law enforcement, and I was very interested in what was he doing in this little teeny town that I grew up about 35 miles from. Wow. Uh, what was he doing that entire time there? And so I ended up leaving the company um, to move back to New York, and we kept talking, and we just decided that we were gonna go for it. And we, you know, um, we found a casting director we really liked named Jennifer Benedetti, who um, does all sorts of stuff, the Southie Brothers stuff, but she also does uh, um, the new HBO, HBO series, um, what's it called? Uh, uh, with with Zendaya, um, Euphoria. Euphoria. <laughs> she does a lot of street casting, uh -huh. and she kind of put a call out and started t talking to agents, and 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 then Charlto came on board, and we saw his uh, he 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 did something very interesting. He did not. We sent pages out, but he didn't do that. 
he basically found an interview that Ted Kaczynski did, and uh, there's very few uh, interviews. There's and one. There's one. Wow. And he found that Literally and one. basically just didn't exact the voice, everything, uh, and just it, we both just... Well, it, was, it was just out. so obvious. It was you know, yeah. That this we was just a person. freaked out. And you know, yeah. when you make these, there's this horrible waiting game where you have to pass around a script forever and wait, and then you know, we just decided to, to hand it out to everybody. And uh, you know, we're so glad we had these delays that the you know it aligned so that Charlton could find it. And luckily, there was another script floating around that was about the uh, uh, another Unabomber story. I think Viggo Mortensen was interested with... Uh, yeah, I, I uh, used the same tape. Oh, yeah. I actually sent it to both Oh, good. We could actually, I was wondering yeah. if we could say this The director publicly. was like, you have to play dead. And I was like, oh, this is a tough one. But I did it for this I'm either the film. villain in this one or kind of the hero in that one. It was kind of weird. They never made that. One, but, they? Yeah, and I think one of our conversations in the beginning, Charlton, was like, maybe he could do both. He could be yeah, the Unabomber actually, yeah. in this Hollywood cop one and then we'll be the, you know, Ted Kaczynski Chronicles that's all Charlton that we the do. All one. Real good, yeah. but luckily that other one fell apart. So there, well, here we well, are. Well, so so for first, Charlotte, like, wait, where did you even find the one interview that Ted did? YouTube, man. You just oh, Ted Kaczynski. YouTube. Of course, YouTube. <laughs> <laughs> it, you, you don't go see him. He, he he. It's a still. It was in jail, oh. and so he. Um, you just hear his voice, and it was just completely different from any version of him, because I started researching, you know, and any of the versions that have been done, I was like, this is not the guy that, you know, I imagined like, I'm gonna kill people, you know? But it was not that. It was this sort of energetic guy who was passionate talking about, basically once he had a microphone, he was, you know, once people were listening, he was really eloquent and sort of nerdily funny and fascinating to listen to. And I just, was, yeah, that was the biggest way into the character for me, was just listening to how he sounded and his energy and kind of going, I feel like I sort of know this, this guy, weirdly. Well, yeah. let's see, now that's the thing. Like, you felt like you knew this guy. Mm. And watching this movie, I felt like I knew this guy. And that is a, like, an incredible accomplishment for, for a film to, especially the way this movie is made, to, to get into somebody's head like that. But, you really had the mother load of research materials because you had his actual words to go on and that's in the script. I mean, how, like, how did that, I mean, it's obviously it did help you, but how did that help you get in his, in his head? Um, yeah, I mean, we had done some research about 10 years ago and then three, four years ago, we got access to all his archives, wow. um, you know, and, you know, he's so honest about how he feels, and he wrote four different autobiographies, you know, and he was writing these entries thinking no one else would ever read them. So they were obviously extra honest. Um, yeah. And, uh, you know, but there was so much material. I mean, up to the end, we did film the movie, you know, over four different shoots over an entire year, so we could have the seasons, we could have the realism of the place. Um, and up to the end, we were trying to get more of these scenes and more of these moments. You know, they were just so fascinating. Um, but, you know, that does tie into that. It wasn't just the research of his words. It was the research of the place, you know, filming on the exact location. You know, it became archaeological at a point. We would find artifacts all the time, every day. We would incorporate them into the film. Obviously, you see some of those scenes. Uh, you know, the scene with the water pipe, we knew that Ted irrigated his garden with a pipe. That pipe was still there from, you know, uh, you know, 25 years later. And we filmed Charlotte trying to figure out how to irrigate his actual garden with his barbed wire. And he was pretty satisfied and excited once he figured it out. Um, but then, too, being in the actual root cellars filming some scenes next to these random, you know, buckets and jugs of chemicals that the FBI had left behind, you know, that who knows what they were. But, um, you know, that was very eerie. So it would affect the actor, it would affect the crew. We would learn things about the story, you know. And then also being there, the people in the town opened up to us and told us stories. So there's plenty of these scenes that, are that you know, were never in the original script that we were told. Um, and we actually can also use those people in the film, too. That, that was the advantage of you being on, right, hey, Matt? Uh, like I think the, that that was Montana. very helpful to have somebody yeah. from Montana there because we, we did have, you know, 
At first, there was some hesitancy, and we actually had a premiere. We, it was very important for us to, to kind of thank the people of Lincoln and of Montana for allowing us into their lives for months and to tell us their, their true feelings and secrets and stories about him. Um, and I think it was helpful that I was able to say, like at the library, for example, the librarian was very hesitant to let us in because she was friendly with him and she thought that we were going to, you know, tear him apart or and not show that he was actually kind to her son and tutored him and all this stuff. And um, but she was really hesitant. And I was like, oh, well, my mom's Judy Flanders. She owns the Montana Book Company in Helena. And she's like, oh. Oh, wow. Oh, I buy books from her. Oh, oh, sh oh, you know what? Okay. Okay. I guess, yeah, I'll talk to you about it. And, you know, and it was just those little Pretty things. And, and that was the Montana spirit. And, you know, and people eventually really opened up to us. And it was, you know, we've made lifelong friends there. And Lincoln is a really interesting place. Um, and, you know, and, and uh, yeah, it was, a, it was a life experience. It was very cool. Yeah. Interesting is a word and a half for it, for sure. Uh, I mean, it's a place that has 600 people and five bars. So it's very lively. <laughs> <laughs> Charles Hall, please tell us about your prep, your research, your, your just immersive commitment to playing Ted Kaczynski. Um, well, like I say, I mean, it was really, I guess, the manifesto was the start, reading that. I actually didn't want to do it when they first sent it to me. They were like, you know, because I, I, I grew up in South Africa. I didn't, I remember something on the news about the Unabomber, but I just thought he was one of these guys, you know, terrorist to like serial killer or blew up a building or something. And they said Unabomber. And I was like, ah, I don't really like doing villains, you know. And so, but then I started researching him, read the manifesto, and I was like, whoa, okay, this is totally, sort of doesn't add up. Like the, what you read in the manifesto, and then what you read about him from that time. It's just like, there was this crazy guy who was blowing up people and we put him away and everyone's fine. Yeah, yeah, right. <clears throat> and you're like, right. wow, that's, uh, okay. It's interesting, you know, but it seems like you, you put him away really quickly. <laughs> <you know? laughs> and it was like, he never spoke and he never came out and said anything, you, you, you know. And so that was really intriguing in terms of his arguments. I had started to feel and notice, because I love gadgets and I love tech, but I'd really started to see how like my phone was just, dominating my life and like I guess everybody you know you start to feel like wow this is really what was it like before there were phones you know and it's like I feel like I was happier before there were phones I, I think I was it's like no you can't be because you couldn't have reached everybody all the time it's like I couldn't have been happier but something in me is like I feel like I still think I was though and um so the the the, the subject matter was interesting and I could relate in that sense to I guess the arguments he was making and then uh, yeah, like I say, the voice was was kind of key for some reason, and his kind of energetic presence coming through the mic, um, and it was really just that and research, and then speaking to people. We got to speak to people in the town. Um, there was literally only one person in the whole of Lincoln that was his friend, which was the librarian, and I said to her, which was interesting. I said, "What?" Once she was trusting us, and you know, we sort of got in there through Matt, and she said, "I said to her, what did you, what do you remember about Ted?" What do you miss about him? And she said, I miss uh, laughing with him. And I was like, okay, wow, that's again something. Everybody else, you know, in the town had sort of encountered him, had negative stuff generally, and he was, he was really quiet, and he never spoke, and he stank, and he, and the librarian was like, you know, he was just very funny guy. Like, he would just make sort of witty, dry, sarcastic, super intelligent, of course, because his IQ is like 167, and she would just laugh with him. And I, I will say that her son, um, she's not doing well, but her son came to the premiere in Montana, his name's Danny, and uh, introduced himself to us, and he said, I've watched every single thing that's ever been done about the Unabomber, because I actually liked him, he was kind to me, he tutored me, he, he meant something to me. Mm -hmm. So I've watched it all, and they've all got it wrong, except you. Well, that's and high praise. it felt really good to, to hear that, um, that, you know, he, he was like, yeah, I know that this guy was was horrible and did horrible, horrible, horrible things, but there was a side to him that there was a kindness, and I didn't fit in, and he made me feel good, and he, um, you know, he helped me, and and that's what Sherry said as well, the the uh, the librarian. I, I have to say, the, watching the film, I watched it before, and then I came in and watched it again tonight, and I just was kind of floored by just how much I thought I knew about the Unabomber, which was what you were describing, that he, you know, this guy did terrible things, they put him away, and that was that. And that's 
clearly, Ted Kaczynski was a very complex person, and he had a side that, that made me, you know, that I, I empathize with him watching this movie. So my question, uh, Tony, for you, for starters, is uh, what were the challenges to, to get that right, like Matt said? Uh, to, well, to get the right balance, we definitely approached it like it was a documentary, you know, where you're really just trying to be honest to the person, to the character, whoever you're documenting. So, um, you know, it was a lot about curating, obviously, his writings, uh, and, you know, and just creating the spectrum. I think that was a big thing of, you know, who this guy was. Um, you know, I think by actually being in the place, hearing what people had to say, you know, and even down to the costumes, you know, we felt very confident of the choices we made. There, was, there weren't things we were searching for. Um, so when you see him, for instance, come onto the sawmill and he's wearing a trench coat that's open, you know, that's what he wore because that's how it was described to from the little neighbor. So, you know, all these different little ticks of him, you know, we, we could lean on, you know, and they could say more than they usually would in a movie. And they were just very crucial to get all these details, you know. So we just kind of gleaned as much as possible. Um, but, you know, we started off with a long cut and there's a balance of, you know, trying to have empathy but also show the heinous things he did, you know, but obviously... It's about getting to the, you know, there's a human behind this, you know, and that was the approach from the beginning. And, you know, as technology has made us more polarized and more black and white our thinking, you know, this is kind of just sort of looking under the hood of what somebody is like and, you know, um, you know, on their, on their own with mental illness and using that subjectivity to kind of be extremely, you know, honest, um, you know, and create a sort of, you know, uh, uh, something that's more true by actually being with this person, you know? Um, you know, and then, yeah, so, you know, it, it, was, it, was, it was a whole process to kind of get that balance right, but kind of like you were saying, feeling like that you knew the Unabomber and this was him, like, you know, you walk, I feel like doing 10 years of research that this, this is as close as you can get, you Absolutely. know, from place to the performance to everything else, you know? But it's a, it's a delicate tightrope, for sure, you know? And there's all sort of pitfalls we could have found, but I think it really does, you know, sum up who this person really was. Yeah, Charlotte, I just want to say what you were saying about our addiction to phones. Like, a couple of weeks ago, I was in a rush, and I, you know, left my, my home without my phone, and I just didn't realize it until I was too far to go back and get it. And... And I felt like oh, lost without my phone. Oh my mm. god! Like it was, and I didn't like I didn't like that I felt that way, you know. Yeah. Uh, but anyway, <laughs> regardless of that, um, the the depth that of your performance is such that I have to ask that: How did that affect you? How I mean, I you know, how did you go to go to that place? Yeah, you know what I mean. Yeah, yeah. Um, I think the other thing, like I sort of simplified earlier when you said, you know, how do you get into the guy's head, just listening to the voice, it was a lot more than that, ultimately just, you know, thinking back, it w he had an enormous amount of writing, and it was brutally honest and incredibly self-aware. Um, you're talking about a guy who's got, you know, 167 IQ and then people are deciding whether or not he's crazy or not, you know what I mean? And I'm kind of like, well, if your IQ is like 105, can you really tell a 167 guy that he, you know what I mean? <laughs> like, are you sure? Are you positive? You know what I mean? How do you know that? Like, yeah. we're all riding on the shoulders of these like 167 IQ giants, frankly, if we're being honest. Mm -hmm. You know, there's a couple of little guys and girls and, you know, around the world that, that you know, invent everything else and work out everything and we just cruise along and you know press the buttons Big job. and he was he was definitely one of those you know ted had that type of mind and so when you go into it you know he would he would be incredibly honest about his his feelings i mean and and you could you know for the humanity of him it was quite easy because he was incredibly lonely he yearned for a woman in his life and it was the strangest thing that he just couldn't um, get a partner, like like as we say in the movie, you know, he tongue rubbed twice. I mean, that's the expression that he actually used. And um, <laughs> but there's heartbreaking stuff, and we shot so much of it. And you know, de deciding for Tony to decide what was going in or out is a very difficult decision. But like he went, there were stories like he, and we we shot them. You know, he went and um, to one of his female friends actually took a dossier on himself, and he basically went like, how? What am I doing wrong? 
how do I get a partner? Like, I'm this and I'm this and I'm that. And like, what am I doing wrong? Or, you know, story, he would write in his diaries, like, he would masturbate and he would think of himself as a woman because he was so starved for female affection and energy. And on the other hand, he would be very sort of, you know, very stereotypically, like you see in the film, very kind of derogatory towards women, as in, like, women have a place. You know, not derogatory in, in the full sense, but old-fashioned. You know, very much like, this is what a man does, this is what a woman does. Um, so it was a, yeah, it was a fascinating. And, and I actually think, I mean, my, I mean, we all have sort of our different takes on what the message is here or what the kind of the, the takeaway take is. And for me, it's a story of someone who's unable to connect. I mean, his whole downfall is due to the fact that he wasn't able to truly connect with his brother and his brother's wife. I mean, had he... You know, they 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 tried to warn him. They tried to say like, you, "This has got to stop," and he just didn't want to, to have anything to do with them. And they're the ones who turned him in, you know, and yeah. for his own for his own good. But in the same way, and what's really amazing is that his brother, basically, before he turned him in, made a deal that he wouldn't get the death penalty. So, uh -huh. um, you know, there's some there's some really deep stuff there about family about uh, human connection and you know it's interesting he's fighting against technology you know because it's going to keep us from connecting it's going to destroy humanity and yet he himself can't connect either so there's there's a lot going on there Tony you say you filmed in Montana over the course of a year how much footage did you shoot I mean, it was a lot, but I mean, you know, I mean, what's good these days because you're shooting digital, it's all just terabytes, and then so I kind of like that you actually don't know what minutes are, you know, because I mean, I also like, you know, there's Herzog's, you know, uh, uh, his line, which is, you know, you don't want to be garbage collectors, you know, as his filmmakers, so I don't think we were garbage collectors by any means, so there really is, you know, a four-hour cut that maybe in 20 years we'll get together and release, you know, but... Um, <laughs> It's, uh, it's all interesting, you know? Uh, but I would say it's probably 100 terabytes, so you can do the math and figure out what we're shooting, but we shot between four and 8K, and so, you know, then once you have 100 terabytes, you gotta have 300 terabytes of storage, so it's, you know, time to drive, so. There was a lot of drives, I'd say. Yeah, there was a lot of driving on that bicycle, too, that we didn't use. Hey, Tony. Hey, we, we got a music. Fuzzy oh, 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 cocksucker. We're going to... Uh, yeah. we I, I think there's, we did. There's a I music did, video that we're going to It was a classic to, joke. You know? We honestly did, like, six days of just bicycle. He would make yeah. me ride, I shit you not, like, 15 like, minutes. Like, drive all the way into town. And then they drive around. I'm like, dude, you're never going to use this. Like, I'm tired. Like, it's going to... He's like, you eh, know, maybe we use... I'm like, come on, man. Really? We, had, we had to do every <laughs> like four shots of the bike. Because you didn't know when you'd need it for the outfit. It, yeah, you know, so, so, have, so you know, you you're glad we did because we might have missed the one moment we needed the bike. This man also cut down that. I mean, that was a fake telephone pole uh, or power line. He cut that down himself. He is the one who cut through that wall to get inside the house. I mean, he Good. did all of this stuff. He's an axe this murderer. Man, this man committed to everything. Did it? He he skinned that rabbit. He, you oh, know, wow. he did everything, and he, he you know. Uh, was running after those motorcycles. I mean, it, it, everything, running up the hills with the gun, shooting at that thing. I mean, it was incredible. Don't, don't clap. Incredible. Don't clap. It's oh, embarrassing. No. When, when you actually, when you actually in Montana and you you've lived in the city, it's embarrassing. Like as a man, like when you realize what you can actually do. It's like I can Uber. Some of the guys are like, "Have you ever cut down a tree?" I'm like, "Um, no, no, I haven't actually. As it, as, as it happens, I don't know how to cut down a tree or like skin a deer or because we also did deer and we did like rabbits, you know, and um, yeah, God help us all. Don't do that civil war thing between like the country people and the city people because it's not like it was back in the day where everyone was kind of tough. Like the city, the city guys are dead. It's like uh, we just, yeah, we, we, yeah, and they were, <laughs> but, but they were just really helpful people too out there. Hey? They were just, everybody was helping us. Everybody was generous, even yeah. down to that scene of chopping the telephone pole. Yeah. They were excited we were going to tell me. that story. Yeah. And the old line crew came in in a, a day, it was pouring rain after work, and dropped those poles in for us for free, you know, just because they were like, oh, you're going to tell the thing that nobody knows, you know? And, uh, and then we chopped it down and made a whole mess and had to get rid of them. But um, yeah, people were just so open and kind. And I think that's where, you know, all these, all these, you know, there's a lot of Ted Kaczynski movies that were, you know, let's say shot in Georgia. They never came to Lincoln. So Lincoln opened up to us because we were telling the Lincoln version, you know, their actual, you know, 
their their tail, and it was you know a very cool experience. I mean, you know, people coming from the coast, people coming from South Africa to you know come to the backyard to shoot their movie. Of course, they'd be skeptical, but I think they saw you know that we were trying to you know, do something different. What, when did you finally say that's a wrap? Do you remember the last scene you shot? I mean, probably like a few months ago, but you know, um, <laughs> I mean, I try to do everything as much as possible, you know, when I can. And it can sometimes it's just me. So you know, uh, you know, pick up shots. Uh, you know, I edited the film. I do try to. There's always trying to squeeze a little bit more blood out of that rock, and um, you know, so yeah, there was a few changes that still happened after you know just before. You know, it went to the lab or while I was at the lab and sending a few shots. So, you know, it, being independent, that allows you to do these things, you know, and um, so. Yeah. I mean, our crew, our crew was in Montana was around, I mean, 20, maybe 25 to 35, usually around 25. That's it. So a, a, even less than that on, on, on... Yeah, I think trying to stay small so you get more days, and I think that's kind of lost in the process, you know, uh, or just how film made, films are made these days, and it's all about actors' schedules and things like that. And that's what's so amazing about Charlto is that he was willing to come back four times and do this, and it just is, you know, a director's dream. And uh, it was also the only way we could make it, and I don't mean to, you know, overly flatter you here, but, like, that is incredible. And, you know, I think any agent hears that and they're terrified, but Charlteau, you know, did it and, you know, it shows and it allowed us to also revisit things and work out things. And, you know, films should t have time to be done right. You know, all our favorite filmmakers had that time and it's something kind of lost in this new system of filmmaking that we need to get rid of. So, so you went back to the set four times. Yeah. So you had to get back into his skin yes. four times. Yes, yes. Oh man, that sounds brutal. Well, it. You know what? It, the funny thing, like somebody asked me the other day in an interview or something, they said, um, you know, was draining on you and tough and everything, and you know, you could in the environment, and I was like, it was actually super relaxing, because <laughs> I'm in the wild. Yeah. I had no trailer. Most of the time, between takes, I had no <coughs> trailer. Tent, tent. And, 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 and uh, there was a tent uh, on, on one of the shoots. Now, uh, one of the times I came, there was a tent. I think the last time. Um, but really, that. what I would do is I would just, between takes, I'd go sit and i just look at a stream. You know, and there was no, there was no big crew and big setup or whatever. I would literally just sit there in the wild looking at a flower for 20 minutes mm -hmm. and literally zen out. You know, like like he says in the in the film, you know, and so I'd be super calm and like whatever, and then he'd be like, Dad, and I'm like, okay, you know, and then go back into it. Or depending on obviously what the scene was. And I spent so much time, you know, just there, just in the forest, and then between uh, moving. So once I remember being back in South Africa and I was riding my bike in a game reserve, and I wasn't really thinking about the movie or anything, I was just enjoying like a mountain bike ride, you know, in this reserve. And all of a sudden, I saw this truck coming, and I got this feeling. And I, I really, that's how I knew it had affected me. I was like, this fucking alien thing, like, coming and destroying, you know, the environment. And it was, I saw the truck as he speaks about it. And, and you know, when you, when you live like that, in an, in an, and he talks about this, obviously, when you live in, an, in a situation where every living thing has a fair shot at everything else, and then suddenly a truck comes, or one of those machines with the, you know, chains, I can't even remember what they're called. Skitter. It's the skitter, that's right. It's like an alien yeah, creature or being. Sure. It would be for us like an alien comes and just has power that is just beyond anything we can fathom completely. Like your nuclear thing goes like, ping, and they just blow that out. And it's like, and so it was, it, so it stayed with me in that way. I, I didn't stay in the, you know, tormented or anything. Um, but the, the tech stuff and, and just looking at my computer <laughs> and, you know, looking at nature. Um, so, yeah, just, just coming back in each time was, was the nature was super helpful. Yeah, I, the last question, I'm, Tony, for you is, and you talked about, like, takeaway. And I, and I feel like a movie like this, you know, you, you should take away what you are going to take away because it is not a conventional film. But did you have a goal when you set out to do this? And how did that goal change over the 10 years? Um, I don't know if I had a goal. Uh, I mean, I, I did want to tell a movie. I mean, part of the story I was interested in is in, you know, as a vehicle to talk about 
environmentalism and uh, or the environment and technology um, and tech can see was that vehicle but I think as we're really facing you know some pretty serious uh, environmental collapse in the in the next decade um, you know in this climate cliff we're going over uh, you know you know we do need to talk about it and Ted Kaczynski brings that up you know so um, you know in the back behind this story those are the things that really concern me um, and it's really dire and we need to we need to address it but wanted to separate that to that this is a tale you know you see Ted's worlds of reaction reacting to it and his solutions uh, they're not the right ones, you know, but maybe we could find some right action, you know, um, uh, to actually kind of deal with this and deal with this extremely quickly. Ladies and gentlemen, so Ted K is in theaters. It is also on demand. Please go on social media, which is the best way to spread a word about a movie these days. Please spread the word about Ted K. Thank you so much for being here. And gentlemen, thank you so very thank you. much. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Thank you.